Welcome everybody, Steve with Tan Books coming at you with another episode of Author Spotlight today with Michael Graney. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Yes. <laughs> Other book. I am ten- I'm sorry. I said I am pleased. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Hashtag me too. Uh, author of the book, Ten Battles Every Catholic Should Know. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. No, no. no. I'm glad you responded back. <laughs> yeah. uh, so tell me, why did you write a book on 10 battles and why just 10? Well, 10 seemed to be the amount I could get together. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I actually had to, uh, a dozen would have been better for the number of chapters, but you notice that the bat, that the that the stories of the Siege of Malta and the Battle of Lepanto were so involved and so long that I cut them in each one into two chapters. So I got the requisite dozen I wanted. (laughs) Um, But as you say, you know, how did I come to write it? Well, it was a very, very long process. Quite some time ago, I was writing articles for Military History and Military Heritage magazine. And at the same time, uh, John Morehouse, who is now at TAN, uh, was editor and publisher of the Catholic Men's Quarterly. Uh, It was a pretty good magazine, but it didn't seem to catch on the way uh, it really should have, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Probably because I think that print magazines were kind of getting on the way out at that point. Mm -hmm. It had done better with a website, but not as good for me. Uh, And he was... I uh, had seen some of my earlier articles on other subjects in a hobby magazine, you know, World Coin News, that had gone into uh, the history of Irish coinage during the Wars of the Roses in Ireland, which actually got me an award. I was, you know, best series for art- article or best series of articles on world coinage for the medieval period. <laughs> I mean, that's rather specialized. But he had <laughs> liked them. And... So he said, do you have anything, you know, for the magazine on battles in which, you know, Catholics took part? And I actually did have about half a dozen that I had worked up in various stages for military heritage and military history. But even though the editors liked them, it was soon after 9-11 and they thought that it would, you know, you know, inspire rage or hatred or something against Muslims. Mm -hmm which was not my intention in writing them. I was just trying to write history. And so I uh, told John, I said, well, you know, take a look at these and see if you like them. And he liked them and published them. Um, After a while, though, the the magazine folded. But when he came back from, I think he was in Chile for a while. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when he came back, he started with Tan. And then we got back in contact and he said, you remember those articles you used to write for, for Catholic Men's Quarterly? I said, well, they're hard to forget. Uh, they were so well written. And he said, you know, have you ever thought about turning them into a book? I've been, you know, following your stuff for quite a while. And, you know, we'd like to have some of your thoughts on Catholic social teaching and on history. But what I'm really interested in right now is something on, you know, m- military history. And so I put them, started collecting what I had. And then when I got about halfway through, I realized, you know, I've got something of a theme here. Because, you know, most people when they're talking about, you know, the various crusades, scatter them all over the map. And they take the the popular battles, Mm -hmm. if that's not an oxymoron. (laughs) And so you get the stuff that was going on in Spain and in the Holy Land and uh, other places. But no one seems to concentrate on what was going on in Central Europe. And so I thought, well, why not? I, why don't I tie that together? So I dug up an article I had begun some time ago on the Battle of Manzikert, which is when the whole interaction with the Turks started, mm-hmm. and then finished one that I had on the real Dracula, and then finished off one that I had on Hutchim. I think that's the way to pronounce it. Apparently, there's a di- million different ways to spell it. Don't ask me. And a million and a half <laughs> ways to pronounce it. Yeah. And uh, so then, I and I also, by strange chance, found some you know uh, a first-hand account of the siege of Nicosia in 1570, which I had not found when I first tried to write the article. So 
with all of that, I managed to get enough to put a whole book together. And then I used the sidebars that you compose for, see, Military Heritage and Military History Magazine have a specific format. Mm -hmm. And they like to have, for every article, two sidebars mm -hmm. that give interesting you know, facts about things related to the battle that are not necessarily part of the battle, mm -hmm. sort of give a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. So with that, those are the historical notes at the end of every chapter, if you if you saw them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, like the rosary after the Battle of Lepanto, and uh, I think you know, the earthworks after the Siege of Vienna is when I, where I put those. Uh -huh. Those were originally intended as sidebars to magazine articles. Understood. And so once we finished that, then I submitted it to John, and he liked it, so it got published eventually. Yeah, when... I, I op when I opened up the chapters, you brought mentioned the first battle, which uh, I've, I've already forgotten how to pronounce. <laughs> Man, <laughs> yeah, I'm going. Just say, just say the dreadful day, which is the way the Orthodox remember it. Yeah, I, I do remember that part. The dreadful day. I'm going. Well, yeah. How, where do you find this one at? It wasn't easy. <laughs> I tracked down. I, I found references to it in uh, Julian Norwich's fantastic history. You know, the, the big three volume thing, if you know anything about Byzantine history. And then from a few authors whose names I can't pronounce. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's no such thing as a small book on Byzantine history. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and then I found references to a very rare book about the dreadful day and managed to track down a copy after a couple of years, which enabled me to finish the book. Um, the the Manzikert is so pivotal to Orthodox history and to, you know, overall Christian history and the history of the Crusades, but there was very little written on it. Can you? Uh, but I had to track down one of the few dedicated books on it. Can you give a, uh, not, to, not to give it all away, can you give a teaser about that? Well, interestingly, the battle need never have occurred. Uh, and frankly, after it was lost, mm -hmm it need not have resulted in a defeat. It, it's very strange. Uh -huh. uh, but it all had to do with the, the bureaucratic party back in Constantinople and the popular party and the military party. The bureaucracy wanted to weaken the military because they figured that would keep them on top. Unfortunately, with the rise of Islam, and everybody else come charging in to take part as much as the Byzantine empires they could possibly grab, weakening the military was not a smart move, as you might imagine. <laughs> so weakening the military and having betrayal in the ranks during the battle didn't help. Mm -hmm. But even then, something could have been salvaged, except the bureaucratic party managed to sabotage that, too. They, uh, the Byzantines lost not only the, the battle, but the war and the peace as well. Yeah. I mean, the Poles talk about World War II as the war they lost twice. Well, the Battle of Manzikert was the war the Byzantines lost three times. <laughs> yeah, talk about going home with your tail between your legs. <laughs> uh, what Of all the battles you came up with, what were your... I mean, you get obviously for people now, they yeah, has Vienna, Malta, Lepanto. By the way, everyone, that's the Lepanto flag back there. Also, I don't know if many people, you've probably seen this. Uh, have you seen the banner? I, I put I put my logo oh, okay. in that one. Okay, that's, yes. That's I, in I, Gaeta. The, the big bat, that's the, for people who don't know, that's the gigantic main battle standard of Lepanto in Hoc Signal Vinces. We bombed it in World War II, so, or was it World War One I? I think it was World War II. So we made the little additions of the whiteness on the back of it. <laughs> Thanks, Alash. Um, Sharpies are for to fill in. Yes. yes. <laughs> that thing's, what, 20 feet tall. Uh, I'm trying, I asked the museum to give me a high definition one. They basically turned around the corner and went, click. And then sent me a going, thanks guys. <laughs> so, yeah. so what were wondering? What was your probably favorite battle to write about? Uh, I'd have to say Jegatvar. It was uh, you know the, the the siege of uh, of the of the castle of Jegatvar in uh, 
1566. I have trouble with dates, but I remember that one. And Count Miklos Zrinyi, another name I'm probably mispronouncing, so all the croats and don't come after me. But, <laughs> Say it with confidence, you know it. <laughs> See the the problem with the with with the Crusades in East in Central and Eastern Europe is that the sources in English are so few and far between that it took so much research to find out. I even had trouble trying to find you know the basic uh, map of oh, wow. of the city. Wow! Uh, but I did find it finally, uh, as you'll see in the in the book. Uh, but just. The, the guy's character really grabbed me for some reason. It was it was like, how many ways can I poke the sultan in the eye? And how many ways can I get back at him? <laughs> the battle started because uh, the, the sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, was going to make one more try to take Vienna. Mm -hmm. Because if you could take Rome or Vienna, you, got, you had Europe. Mm -hmm. And Suleiman the Magnificent wanted to conquer Europe. So he assembled what may have been the, the largest military force he had been ever put together and started out for Vienna by way of Budapest because he already controlled Budapest. Mm -hmm. Well, along the way, Count Miklos Zrinyi decided to take a band of about 100 or so men and attack one of the, uh, you know, the, the columns under the command of a friend of Suleiman. Well, he killed him and made off with some loot and Basically, it should have been considered nothing more than an irritating annoyance by Suleiman and said, oh, you know, forget that, we'll get him on the way back. Instead, he diverted the entire column to reduce the, the castle of Jegetvar and punish Miklos Zrinyi for his impudence in attacking a column of the, of the Sultan while the Sultan was trying to go about important business of conquering Europe. He said, this will take only a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Well, it tied the Sultan down for three months. He died at the end of the siege himself. And his vizier, Sokoli, tried to keep the, the secret from getting out. So basically, he had the embalmed Sultan stuck up on a throne to observe the battle. <laughs> so it's weakened at Bernie's battle style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> But that's basically what it was. Just his arms up. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to do that when I'm on camera. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, they finally succeeded in, you know, reducing the castle and killing everybody there. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time, it was three months too late even to think about making your way into Hungary, much less Vienna. To Vienna, yeah, yeah. so they went back with the Sultan's body uh, to Istanbul. On the way, undertaking a minor siege to convince people that the Sultan was still alive. the The problem was that there, you know, the the Ottoman method of succession was that whoever got there first just got it. Yeah. And Sokoli's candidate was not a very good candidate, but he was someone whom Sokoli thought he could. Uh, control, uh, where you had the father was Suleiman the Magnificent, the son was Selim the Drunk. He was a raging alcoholic. So he had to keep, Sokoli had to keep Suleiman's death secret as long as he possibly could to put his candidate in solid before anybody else got there. Politics as usual, you know. And then keep him away from the bottle so you don't rat his mouth out. <laughs> Or actually keep him on the bottle so that he can't become conscious. <laughs> so you got a dead guy up there and he's passed out, so we're yep. good. <laughs> That's pretty much. You, you, you pretty much summed up the Ottoman leadership. <laughs> What's the plan? I don't know. <laughs> just just go charge it in with as many people as you can get. Yeah. You got to go that way. You got to go that way. Don't screw minutes. anything up. Good luck. <laughs> I'll be with you. Uh, yeah. So what are yeah. some... Um, what are some what do you want readers to get out of this obviously to know history a little bit more but i'm sure there's other other things like be wild maybe uh, dig more deeper into the crusades in general well actually what i my one of my primary reasons was to get more people to appreciate the role of central and eastern europe in history mm -hmm. 
I mean, a lot of people don't realize that the center of activity in Europe was in Central Europe for centuries. Mm -hmm. England and France and even Italy were on the fringe. Mm -hmm. I mean, the great Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, of which most people know absolutely nothing, was one of the most powerful countries in the world for a couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and the king was a constitutional monarch, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. He was elected. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce this name, but if you want some really good fictional accounts of it, uh, the the Polish-Lithuanian author Heinrich Sienkiewicz, I, I think that's how it's pronounced. You're Father, the uh, Corrected me on it. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't stick. Uh, if you read, most people know him for Quo Vadis, you know, the novel that was made into a movie that the movie was okay, but it wasn't as good as the novel. Trans the best translation, of course, is by an Irish folklorist, Jeremiah Curtin, uh, and is the most popular one. But if you want the, the book that is most popular in Poland and in Lithuania, uh, it's, it's actually a trilogy. Uh, you know, it's called The Deluge. It's about, you know, what happened in Poland in the mid 17th century that brought down the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. It is magnificent is is a mild way of putting it uh, my i have a personal theory that brings in tolkien that the lord of the rings which tolkien insisted was not a trilogy mm -hmm. was based on with fire and sword which is the first volume in sinkovich's shinkovich's uh however you pronounce it pardon all the lithuanians and poles please don't come after we're me we're picking up what you're putting uh, down <laughs> yeah. uh but the first volume in in that guy's trilogy, uh, with fire and sword, mm -hmm. if you read it, it's a this sounds an awful lot like Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. That but that is a personal theory. Don't come after me by saying how dumb I am to have it. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, most people have no comprehension or even understanding or knowledge of what was going on in that area. Mm -hmm. And of course, a secondary one is not to glorify war. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope that the stories, you know, glorified the heroes there mm -hmm. and the people whose efforts made, you know, managed to carry through these things, but not the war itself. I mean, as I tried to make clear in some of in the way I write, wrote some of them and, you know, the, the little notes, there was always an alternative to what happened. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah. Um Speaking of another battle, I was just it popped in my head because I'm looking at the Lepanto flag. But before it, Famagusta. Oh yeah, Could you that was one of the, the epics of history that almost no one in the West knows about. Yes, and Bragadino, who was the civil governor, and who, unlike a lot of Venetian politicians, actually had some common sense and some and a sense of duty. Mm -hmm. uh they expected him, you know, Famagusta, which was a, a, an unimportant little town again, mm -hmm. uh, to fall within a matter of days. It held out for almost a year. And at the end of the siege, uh, I think they had maybe two or three barrels of gunpowder left. Mm -hmm. Of course, Venice had managed to resupply them occasionally by running the Turkish blockade, mm -hmm. but it still wasn't easy i mean the, the the entire city was in ruins by the time the the siege which siege was over yeah there was a part of lapanta was a battle cry of them yelling famagusta famagusta oh yeah because they found out a couple of days before lapanto what had happened at famagusta i not to give a spoiler but mm -hmm. there had been a negotiated surrender and the turkish commander violated the terms to say it to put it mildly very mildly yes yes yeah, uh, i tried not to give too many details but you still need a strong stomach to read about it yes for sure well michael i appreciate the uh appreciate you coming on this has been great uh 20 minutes flew by in two seconds i i survived you did see well it's, it wasn't a battle <laughs> no it was very enjoyable thank you thank you very much We'll put we'll put the link underneath in the show notes section. Everybody get ten battles every Catholic should know because every Catholic should know them. So every Catholic should buy the book. Michael, appreciate your time. 
Oh, thank you. It's great having you. Thank you. Take care.